Hello, this is Pastor Frank, and the message this week is entitled, That's Not Fair, and it's taken from John chapter 9. From uh, early childhood, those that, that, that phrase, that's not fair, can be heard. You're not playing fair, or something being unfair. Well, in John chapter 9, there is an individual who, as we evaluate his life, uh, some might think, that's not fair. But uh, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read most of the chapter and stop periodically to make a comment or so, and then uh, have an application at the end. But let me pray before I begin. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word, and I thank you for the Holy Spirit who has given us your word. And I pray that the Holy Spirit who has uh, given this by inspiration and has preserved it down through the ages would now take this and uh, work it into our lives for your glory and for your honor and for our good. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. John chapter 9, beginning at verse 1. The Bible says, Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now, the individual in this story is a man. And some sources say that uh, a boy became a man at around the age of 13. Well, often it seems to me that in the New Testament, if or, or the whole Bible, if if uh, if a man is young like that, he's referred to as a young man. And here it just says a man. Uh, but also the way he's going to speak later on to the religious leaders uh, it seems to me that he is not in his early teens. He seems to be uh, considerably more uh, mature than that. Uh, the fact that we find him so closely connected with his parents is not unusual. Uh, down through the years, I have known several instances where parents have cared for their adult children, um, especially those who are handicapped in one way or another. And some would consider this guy a handicapped individual because he was blind from birth. Now it's easy to question why. The disciples question, Lord, why is this man blind? It's easy to question why. It's easy to look for physical reasons as to why something happens. And it's easy to blame bad things on something like sin. Somebody did something wrong. Somebody sinned uh, in, that this happened. Uh, maybe I've sinned because I'm suffering this or that. Uh, there's got to be an explainable reason why this man was blind from birth. The disciples want to know why. Well, verse 3, Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. It's like, wait a minute. The reason this man was blind from birth, the reason he missed out on so much the reason he missed out on a normal childhood and the reason he had to resort to becoming a beggar, we're going to see that in verse 8, all this was so that God could show something about himself through this guy? Well, yeah. Yeah. Um, people often fail to remember who God is. People sometimes get to thinking that God is our servant. That God exists in order to please us, to make life easy for us. It's all about us. In Psalm 139, the, uh, the, the psalmist is writing, speaking to the Lord, and he's writing about uh, his life, about his own life. And the psalmist says this in Psalm 139, beginning in verse 13. He says, you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. God, you did this. You created me. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret in the, and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they were all written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there was none of them. The psalmist is recognizing God. You are the one that that knit me together in my mother's womb. Um, Psalm 100 says, 100 says that, uh, that we have not made ourselves. 
he is God. And so uh, Jesus says in verse 3, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that. Okay, this man has, was born blind, that the works of God should be revealed in him. Verse 4, Jesus continues. He says, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. It's, just, it's, it's beautiful here. The light of the world brought light to this man who had never seen the light. Well, the way Jesus went about this is, is quite interesting. Uh, he spit, took the saliva, mixed it with some, with some uh, soil, and, and, and then applied that, and then told the man to go wash. Um, other times, just the simple touch was all that was needed. Uh, other times, all that was needed was for Jesus to speak the word. J. Vernon McGee said that um, people, if they were thinking like a lot of people do now, would insist that how it happened to them is the way it's got to happen. Uh, some would say, all he needs to do is touch you. Others would say, no, he's got to spit and make, make uh, mud with the saliva and, and anoint you, and you've got to, got to go wash. Others would say, um, no, all he needs to do is, is speak the word. And so J. Vernon McGee said that uh, those who believed in touch only, their theme song would be, he touched me. He touched me. Oh, he touched me. And oh, the joy that flood my soul. Those who uh, believed that all he had to do was speak the word, J. Vernon McGee says their theme song would be, Only believe. Only believe. All things are possible. Only believe. And then McGee said the guys like this, who the mud was applied and had to go wash, their theme song would be, Shall we gather at the river? I think it was Vance Havner. <laughs> I think it was Vance Havner who said one time that these three guys would form a denomination. Each would form their own denomination, uh, teaching that it had to be done the way it was done to them. And so Havner said you would have the Wordites, the Touchites, and the Mudites. Um, well, verse 8. Therefore the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind said, Is not this he who sat and begged? So you see, he was, he was a beggar here. Some said, This is he. Others said, He is like him. The man said, I'm, I am he. Therefore they said to him, How were your eyes opened? He answered and said, a man called Jesus made clay and, to, and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go wash in the pool of Siloam. So I went and washed, and I received my sight. Then they said to him, Where is he? And the man said, I do not know. Now this man had heard Jesus' voice. He had heard him speak to him, but he was blind. He had never seen Jesus. Uh, Jesus had said, after he anointed his eyes, go wash, and he came back seeing. So he had never seen Jesus. But the answer that he gave, I do not know. That's going to come up again later. Verse 13. They brought him who formerly was blind to the Pharisees. Now it was a Sabbath when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also asked him again how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put clay on my eyes, and I washed, and I see. Therefore some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, because he does not keep the Sabbath. Others said, How can a man who is a sinner do such things? And there was a division among them. Now notice, some of the Pharisees were so upset because Jesus did not keep the Sabbath. When I was considerably younger, there was, I was in a, a big meeting, and, and I, I've shared this before, but there was a, a, a young man there that he had long hair and some tattoos, and I right away formed an opinion of him. And then uh, the person who was leading our time asked all the pastors to stand, and so I stood, and, 
He said to the rest of them, he's, of the people, he said, find a pastor who is standing near you and go over and lay your hands on him and pray for him. And this young man who I had formed my opinion of came over and laid his hands on me with others and uh, was one of them that prayed for me. And then after he uh, got done, after everybody got done and they were going back to their seats, this uh, young man embraced me and he said, I love you, brother. And it's like, who cares about the long hair and the tattoo? My, my opinion of him changed. Well, you know, these Pharisees, they're supposed to be elders. Uh, they're supposed to be mature, and yet they're so messed up in their thinking when it comes to judging certain things. And so they judge Jesus as a sinner. And why? Because he dared <laughs> to spit and make a little mud and apply it to this guy's eyes and bring about a healing. You know, these, these Pharisees had a big problem with Sabbaths. Uh, in, in Luke chapter 13, the Bible says that Jesus one day was teaching in the synagogue. And it was a Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman. This is uh, chapter 13 of Luke, beginning in verse 10. There was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bent over and could not in no way raise herself. But when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said to her, Woman, you are loose, loose from your infirmity. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation, because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. And he said to the crowd, There are six days on which men ought to work. Therefore come and be healed on them, and not on the Sabbath day. The Bible says that the Lord then answered him and said, Hypocrite! Does not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it away to water? So ought not this woman, being the daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, think of it, for 18 years, should she not be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath? In the next chapter, in Luke chapter 14, there was a man who had a disease, and Jesus healed him on the Sabbath. And the uh, Pharisees got all bent out of shape there. And they, uh, but the Bible says in verse 3 that Jesus said uh, to the Pharisees, the lawyers, the Pharisees, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? But they kept silent. And so he took the man and healed him, and let him go. And then he answered them, saying, Which of you having a donkey or an ox that has fallen into a pit? will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day? And they could not answer him regarding these things. You know, the Bible says here in, in John 9 that there was a division. Well, we really see this here. Jesus said he came to bring division. And uh, it's definitely a division here in John chapter 9. Well, verse 17. They said to the blind man again, blind man again, what do you say about him? Because he opened your eyes. He said, he's a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him who had received his sight and they asked them, saying, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered them and said, well, we know he's our son and he was born blind, but by what means he now sees we do not know or who opened his eyes we do not know. He's of age. Ask him. He'll speak for himself. The Bible says here in verse 22 that his parents said these things because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if anyone confessed that Jesus was the Christ, that they would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, he is of age. Ask him. So they again called the man who was blind and said to him, Give God the glory. We know this man is a sinner. How do they know that Jesus is a sinner? Because he dared to heal a man on the Sabbath. Verse 16. I love the honesty of this man's answer to these religious leaders in the next verse. Verse 25. 
The Bible says that this man answered and said, Whether he is a sinner I, or not, I do not know. But one thing I know, that though I was blind, now I see. That's scripture. I do not know. I, there's been so many times over the years that I have quoted this scripture. I don't know. I don't. It's, it's only a part of a verse, but I quote scripture when I say, I do not know. Uh, it seems like I'm quoting it more and more as I get older. Uh, after all these years, there are so many things that I realize I do not know. I thought I did at one time, but I do not know. And the older I get, the closer I stick with Scripture, because that I do know. Uh, the older I get, the more I try to stay away from, from two words. And those words are, I think. <laughs> I think. It seems like over the years, in conversations, sometimes in arguments, and people say, I think. Well, I think. This is what I think. And I am found in reality, it doesn't matter what I think. It matters what God says. And so anyhow, I've been trying to stay away from those, using those words in a conversation or in a debate. You know, I, I think. Well, the entirety of this man's answer in verse 25 is precious. He says, there's things I do not know, but one thing I know, that I was blind and now I see. Again, the older I get, the less I'm interested in arguing theological points, uh, theological debates. Now, I used to enjoy it a lot. I used to get very taken up in debates. And it's not that I don't have strong opinions on things anymore. I do. I'm just not interested in arguing or debating. I leave that to younger people. In 1 John 2, the Apostle John addresses what seems to be people in different ages of their spiritual journey. And he says there in 1 John 2, he says, I write to you, little children, because you have known the Father. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. That's verses 12 through 14. So any more debates, arguments about things uh, that are not heaven and hell issues. I mean, that's different. But arguments or debates over issues, I choose to leave those to other people. For me, it's this. One thing I know, and this is what Jesus has done for me. Well, verse 26 of John chapter 9, Then they said to him again, What did he do to you that he opened your eyes? And this man who was born blind said, answered and said, I told you already. And did you not listen? Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become one of his disciples? I love this. The Pharisees didn't take this very well. Verse 28, they reviled him. One translation said they, they cursed him and said, You are his disciple, but we are Moses' disciple. We know that God spoke to Moses. As for this, this fellow, we do not know where he is from. And the man who had been born blind, he answered and said to them, Why? <laughs> this is a marvelous thing that you do not know where he is from. Yet he opened my eyes. Now we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears him. Since the world began, it has been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind, who was born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Now you see the boldness of this man in saying this to these religious leaders. That's one of the reasons I think this guy was not in his early teens. Maybe not in his teens at all. Verse 34, they answered and said to him, You were completely born in sins. And are you teaching us? And the Bible says they cast him out. Notice how mean people get when they have a weak case. <laughs> or they can't control or persuade someone. You know, many, many years ago, I, I heard this statement that, the, that strong words come from a weak mind. 
strong words come from a weak mind. Well, these Pharisees here are getting pretty strong in their words and uh, and their actions. They cast him out. Verse 35. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and when he found him, he said to him, Do you believe in the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? This is beautiful. Jesus came looking for this guy. The interest that Jesus showed in this man who was blind for all those years, it's a precious thing. This man may no longer be welcome in the synagogue and around those Pharisees, but to have Jesus show this kind of interest in him, wow. Now remember this man being born blind and then having washed in the pool, he had never seen Jesus. So this man asked him, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? Verse 37, Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Now think of it. Uh, if this man had not been born blind, he would not have had this encounter with Jesus that we read about. If this man had not been born blind, we would not be reading his story well over 2,000 years later. If this man had not been born blind, his life would not have revealed the works of God like it did. Go back to verse 3. Jesus says, this is why this guy is born blind, that the works of God might be revealed in him. And so if he had not been born blind, his life would not have revealed the works of God like it did. Life might seem unfair. Oh, brothers and sisters, life might seem very unfair. We might not have what other people have, whether it's the good health that other people have or the, the possessions or the home, things like that. We may not have that. We may not have the family that other people have. We might not be able to go where other people go because of our health or because of limited finances or for whatever reason. We might not be able to do what other people take for granted. When I was a teenager, a man was talking to me about this guy in the community. And uh, he said, that man could fall down an outhouse and come up smelling like a rose. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever been around outhouses, but falling down an outhouse, I don't, you have to be a very special person to come up smelling like a rose. And the meaning was, no matter what this guy did, it seemed to turn out. It seemed to be a positive thing. Business-wise, it seemed to work out. No matter what he did. So there was that man. And then there was my dad. My dad was a hard worker. My dad was gen generous with everything he had, whether it be his time or his possessions. But my dad suffered from asthma, uh, that poor health. And my dad was financially poor. <laughs> we were poor. We were very poor. But I think of my dad and I think of this guy who, who was a hard worker and generous and yet poor and in poor health. And I think of this other guy who could fall down an outhouse and come up smelling like rose. It's like, I'll take dad. And not just because he was my dad. But with all the unfairness of life, I have never met anyone who revealed Christ more than my dad. Much more than this other individual who could fall down an outhouse and come up smelling like a rose. I'll take dad because the life of Christ was evidenced in him. Fanny Crosby was a, a wonderful woman, a tremendous woman of God. She wrote many, many gospel hymns and our hymnal that we use here at the Balsam Bible Chapel, I count it has 16, 16 of her hymns in it. And I came across something that Fanny wrote about herself. Uh, let me read it for you. 
She said this. She said, when I was a little baby, six weeks old, in April of 1820, my eyes became sore and red. A stranger who claimed to be a doctor put hot cloths on my eyes, and although the infection went away, white scars formed over my eyes. And afterward, I couldn't see. My poor mother. 1820 turned out to be a very terrible year for her. Not only were my eyes blinded, but my father died as that year after getting sick from working in a field in pouring rain. Mother had to go to work as a housekeeper for a rich family. I stayed home with Grandma Eunice. Grandma taught me all about flowers, trees, sunsets, and birds. She showed me how to handle things and to remember them by the way they felt. In the autumn, we took walks through the meadow and gathered leaves until we made a, a large pile. After I jumped in them, Grandma always handed me a leaf and asked me to tell her which tree it came from. It didn't take long until I knew the names and descriptions of all the trees, flowers, and birds among the hills outside our home. I loved Grandma and enjoyed listening to her as she prayed, recited poetry, and read the Bible to me every day. She said that God had a special purpose for everything he made, including me, Francis Jane Crosby. She says, everybody called me Fanny. She says, I remember where the furniture and doors were in our house. I, I walked around easily. But the hardest thing about being blind is that I couldn't go to school with the other children. I could play with them, but how do you read when you can't see? As I grew older, Grandma helped me to memorize parts of the Bible. Fanny Crosby was an amazing one. She says, in fact, by the time I was 12 years old, I had memorized all of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. <laughs> now, I can understand memorizing Genesis and part of Exodus and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but memorizing Leviticus and Numbers? It's like, well, whatever. Uh, but she memorized this. these. Uh, she said the Bible verses were like friends and cheered me up whenever I felt sad about not going to school. Now, listen to this next. She says, when I was eight years old, I made up a poem and recited it to Grandma. And this was the poem. Oh, what a happy child I am, although I cannot see. I am resolved that in this world contented I will be. How many blessings I enjoy that other people don't. To weep or sigh because I'm blind, I cannot and I won't. End quote. Talk about things being unfair. Life was not fair for Fanny Crosby. Blinded at such an early age, no fault of, of her own, the fault of somebody else. Uh, life was not fair for her poor mother, who ended up having to go to work, and therefore leaving the care of her child uh, with, with Grandma. Uh, but would God have used Fanny the way he did? Would the works of God have been, have been revealed in her and through her like they were if life would have been fair for Fanny or for her, her dear mother? Again, John 9, verses 2 and 3, the disciples asked Jesus, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered and said, Neither this man nor his parents sinned but that the works of God should be revealed in him. In the unfair things of life, that's still God's plan. It was planned for this man back in the Bible. It was the plan, plan for Fanny Crosby. It was the plan for Johnny Erickson Tata. Her story is amazing. How unfair things were for her, are for her, and yet what a woman of God. 
That's still the plan that I saw in my dad. That's the plan that I've seen play out in a lot of people's lives over the years. Life is unfair. But in that unfairness, the works of God shine through so beautifully. May people be able to see the works of God in your life and in mine. Heavenly Father, thank you for being who you are. And Father, there are times in this life, in this world, when things do seem unfair. We are not able to do what other people can do or we have what other people have or go where other people go. And Father, sometimes we can have this, the, the pity party, feeling sorry for ourselves. But if Father, help us to see the sovereignty of you and that you are in control and that you are orchestrating all things for your glory and for our good. The Bible says that all things work together for good to those who love you and who are the called according to your purpose. So help us, Father, to ra rather than to be buried in self-pity or frustration or even anger, help us to see the work of God that you want to accomplish in us and people to see through us. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord bless you, brothers and sisters.